bueno, tenemos que dar las, otra vez las gracias a Sergey porque lo que, bueno, estamos en un post, postdoc conferencia, ¿no? O sea que, que ten, tendremos um, comida para pensar, no sé si se dice esto en castellano, pero, o sea que la, las palabras, los conceptos trabajaremos uh, a continuación de, de, de su conferencia. Ahora tengo el placer de, de presentar, o no voy a presentar, es solamente para pasar la palabra a Boyana Sievich. Lo que es importante es... ¿Cómo? Sievich. Yeah. Um, es que uh, un tema muy importante, una pregunta muy importante que, que Sergei ha abordado y que está presente a la vez en... Uh, como, como dices, has dicho, la cronodiversidad que puede intentar traer, sobre todo esta exposición, ¿no? que hay películas de 20, 30 minutos, este proceso, como he dicho, de caminar a través de las obras. El, el, el tema del tiempo es un tema recurrente que intentamos abordar, sobre todo cuando um, hay esta, o sea, esta cuestión sí, de, de, de traer formatos de distintos formatos de, de formatos de distintos temporalidades uh, ¿cómo, cómo podríamos pensar la idioritmia de la exposición porque esto tiene su vida su vida propia y que está afectada por factores como el tiempo que tenemos el tiempo que queda el tiempo que pagamos um, o el tiempo que podemos dedicar a esto. O sea que voy a, a continuación, coger el tiempo para, para hablar de ritmo, poesía y intensidad. O sea que hacemos esto otra vez, 45 minutos de, de charla, y luego pregunta, y luego subiremos a seguir conversando, a la vez también con Boyana y Sergey. O sea que, Boyana. Do you hear me? Yeah, this is working now. First of all, I would like to congratulate uh, the curators and the team and the artists on this exhibition. And this is beyond a formal thank you, uh, because um, it's quite rare that I don't feel alienated on the occasions to be invited to speak, um, in, especially in um, uh, um, museums uh, and similar venues. And I hope that you will understand that this is not just a personal um, remark and compliment and that through my talk, um, it will be actually more theorized. So what I would like to do in this talk today, and I will press my timer to, to make sure that I can manage my 45 minutes, is to share a, a reflection of a, on several ideas uh, that um, Laurence already introduced, rhythm, intensity, the poetic, and the social imaginary, um, combined uh, with a few more, more or less detailed narrative accounts on um, contemporary forms of um, life and work, uh, which come from my research on self-performance uh, today. Um, and I'd like to uh, start by evoking a lecture by Roland Barthes from 1977, from a series that he gave uh, in a seminar um, at Collège de France at the invitation of Michel Foucault, that were later published under the title How to Live Together. And uh, in the opening lecture, Roland Barthes uh, starts with meditating on a theme, How to Live Together by saying that there is nothing contradictory um, about wanting to live together and living alone. Living together and living alone. And at first, it's a spatial uh, fact. It's a question of sharing, distributing, uh, in cohabiting the same space. But it's also a temporal fact. And he poses the question, who are my contemporaries? Who are your contemporaries? And this is a question that resonated uh, with me when I visited the exhibition yesterday and saw the series of drawings uh, by Cisco Mensua, and I was reminded of this question of history, a history that is uh, disappearing, and I was thinking, what would happen if I came with my students uh, from a contemporary dance school parts um, to the exhibition, and who would be able to tell you more about Beyonce than about any of those figures and places uh, that have been indexed as the world of that artist? Um, now, this 
theme of living together, Roland Barthes introduces with his method, uh, the method that he would employ um, in a quite enigmatic uh, way. It's quite incredible to read this transcript uh, of lectures uh, as a text today. And that's phantasmatic teaching, uh, how to elaborate a research inquiry from a fantasy. And he cherishes a fantasy about living together, and as a fantasy, fantasy must have a scene, a situation. He describes himself in a place that he never visited, that he only fantasized about, which is Athos, uh, the holy um, mountain in Greece um, where monks live in monasteries. And there's, of course, the mountain, the, uh, the landscape, the sea in the distance, the white walls. And Bart, who imagined himself uh, living in two rooms of his own and having maybe two rooms for his friends close by, and maybe there is a third place, which in a monastery would be a synax, or for Bart, rather a library where they would sometimes meet together. And to describe this way of living, Bart must forge a new word, a new term, and this is where idiorhythmy comes. And um, to explain uh, this concept, he um, picks up from his older colleague, structural linguistic Emil Benveniste, um, the notion of rhythm, uh, the etymology of rhythm in the Greek word rhythmos. Um, this was an article written in 1951. And Benveniste reveals or discovers two roots of the word rhythmos, uh, which has a different meaning than rhythm uh, in ancient Greek texts, and one is uh, rain, rain to flow, the verb to flow, uh, which is an important notion in pre-Socratic philosophy, um, for instance, in atomism, the manner of atoms flowing, or for Heraclitus, as you probably know. And there is the suffix tmos, and tmos uh, indicates the modality of being unaccomplished, or maybe even incomplete. So, rhythmus was used um, in very different contexts. It signified a letter that would be arbitrarily shaped in handwriting, peplos or peplum, this kind of cloth uh, that hangs on the body and forms itself on the contours of the body in, in Greece, and as you also know from Roman sculpture. Um, or a particular state of a character, theater character, a mood. So it's a pattern of fluid elements, um, something that is mobile, uh, changeable, improvised, but still distinct, has a distinctive form, a proportionate figure, but it's not measurable, it's not a measured movement. So rhythm in the ordinary sense that we use today, uh, as we uh, recognize in music or in dance, dates from much later, from Plato, uh, when it was bound with number with meter, with metrics, with quantification. So there is an opposition between rhythm and rhythmos. Uh, rhythmos is sudden. It's about sudden emergence, suddenness, fragility, arbitrariness. And Bart, in this uh, digression in his text, adds um, that it's a configuration without fixity or natural necessity. It's a flowing. Uh, une manière de fluer, a manner of flowing. So, since rhythmus uh, is by definition individual or singular, idiorhythm is almost a pleonasm, because idios means the same, uh, the one that belongs, personal. Uh, and Bart uh, defines this register as the manner um, in which the individual inserts himself, herself in the social, the fugitivity of the code, the interstices. But in the second register, it also means the subtle forms of life, which means unstable configuration of moods, phases of depression, um, exaltation, the exact opposite of um, regular cadence, of the metrics, of the inflexible. Um, and it's because rhythm, since Plato, acquired a repressive meaning, um, a meaning that uh, is about uh, regimentation, compartmentalization. It was necessary for Bart to add this prefix idios and to create, to forge this word 
idiorhythmy. So living together in its original setting of Athos, as he fantasizes, um, means that idiorhythmy is the proportion of a community, a fantasized community. And the, the advantage lies in the enabling uh, force that it's a proportion without measure, without figures, without numbers, without, um, without scale, as massive scale. So obviously the utopian phantasmatic aspect of idiorhythmy is a community that is not synchronized, where there are a lot of blank spaces, a lot of walls in between that separate and gather at the same time. If you want also how Sergei talked about it, gaps. Um, which, of course, in the 80s, uh, when the community became a new topic uh, with um, the slow decline of communism, especially among French intellectuals, means that it's a fantasy of, um, of a community without ideological unity, uh, without repressive togetherness. Um, and maybe it's not so uh, smart of me to add another image to abundance of images and words and sounds that you will see or you have seen in this exhibition. But this work is close to both Mladen Stilinovic and, um, and Roland Barthes. It dates from 1979. It's by Sonia, Sanya Ivekovic called Triangle. Oops, I'm sorry, I'm trying, ah yeah, okay, left. Okay, are we there? So this is the score of a performance, which we don't know if it took place, because it's documented in photographs. Um, the action takes place on the day of the President Tito's visit to the city. The city is Zagreb, uh, the capital of Croatia and former Yugoslavia. And it develops as intercommunication between three persons. A person, uh, so there you see the the motorcade that Tito passes by, a person on the roof of a tall building across the street of my apartment, a policeman in the street in front of the house, myself on the balcony. Due to the cement construction of the balcony, only the person on the roof can actually see me and follow the action. My assumption is that this person has binoculars and a walkie-talkie apparatus. I notice that the policeman in the street also has a walkie-talkie. The action begins when I walk out onto the balcony and sit on a chair. I sip whiskey, read a book, and make gestures as if I perform masturbation. After a period of time, the policeman rings my doorbell and orders that the persons and objects are to be removed from the balcony. Uh, now, this would be a great example of a phenomenology from one's window, as Henri Lefebvre introduced rhythm analysis, which explores or perhaps examines the possibility of polyrhythmicity in an occasion where the public space is rhythmicized by a public political event. It's a state performance, the performance of the president visiting the city. And what we see here is a clash of two rhythms. The, rhythms of, uh, the rhythm of cheering the president, which is obviously desirable and dominant. Um, and then the leisurely activity uh, of masturbating while reading a book and sipping whiskey, um, not only by an individual, but by a woman, um, which is not only inappropriate, um, but clashes because it counters and perhaps disrupts the rhythm of public order, therefore revealing the repressive nature of socialist, yet thought to be liberal government. Now, 20 years um, after this uh, instance and uh, Roland Barthes lectures, um, the topic of rhythm returns, and I've been studying it lately, and I, I don't have time here to elaborate on many conceptions of rhythm that are quite interesting, but I would like to pit idiorhythmy um, against a few other ideas of interest uh, that are more contemporary. And the first one that I would like to talk about is synchronization. Now, synchronization and the new apparatuses of synchronization uh, that owe to digital technology. Um, and you're all familiar with the fact that we as internet users, every time we come to internet, we deliver um, our data and metadata that are being extracted. 
And that means that we not only allow uh, the financial market to uh, penetrate our lives, but it's also that this temporality of the governance of the market, the digital temporality, is omnipresent. And everything can be nowadays datified. Uh, this is what algorithms do. They can predict the future thanks to datification. Now, the aim of the prediction is to uh, protect the market from risks, to um, calculate all possible scenarios. Um, and we also know that the paradox is that the future is predicted on the image of present. Therefore, it must sometimes fail, which it does. Uh, but in sociology and social science at the moment, uh, the main trouble or the, uh, the main concern is um, the consequence of this thinking model. This thinking model uh, which makes into, uh, in inferences, uh, uh, which means uh, uh, makes uh, judgments and uh, um, conclusions on the basis of correlation. So, uh, the old scientific theoretical method of explanation is becoming obsolete. It means anything can be put in correlation. Different data are put in correlation to draw most outrageous, sometimes important, very often trivial, but you never know when it will become useful, um, observations. And there is this uh, famous phrase, numbers speak for themselves. Um, so we can think about what it means to make decisions on the basis of correlation rather than explanation, explanation of social phenomena. Um, now, in an attempt to account um, for the material status of digital information, Florian Schneider proposed the concept of imaginary property, um, which could be defined as um, a link, a conjunction between, I quote Schneider, property that becomes increasingly a matter of imagination, on the one hand, and images that are subject to ongoing propertization. On the one hand, it means, you know, we know, uh, we have all this experience being in public space and not actually knowing whether this is public space or private. And that goes on, uh, that applies even more to images, to whom images belong. Um, and the fact that the images are also a way of rendering experiences ownable. Uh, so this imaginary property in uh, Florian Schneider's uh, uh, terms arises in the absence, or I could say also volatility, of the object that can be known. Uh, but the imagination doesn't result from the struggle to define the relationship between the owner and the object known, but from, I quote, um, social relationship with others who could also use it, enjoy it, play it, or play with it. Um, and now comes my uh, blunt critique of <laughs> institutions and of um, apparatus of synchronization and their applications in, um, in venues like museums. And I would like to give you a little case, a little story here. Um, uh, you, you, you probably know that uh, Tate Modern is opening or has now reopened tanks, uh, which is supposed to be the uh, future permanent venue for performance and other time-based arts. And uh, in the first instance of the opening, um, uh, a series of performances and lectures were uh, presented under the banner of Art in Action. But the program also introduced an apparatus of capturing experience, datifying it uh, into information. Uh, and the marketing department and another department that I learned about, it's called the Department of Visitors Experience, at Tate Modern, um, developed programs of social media metrics. So this capturing apparatus identifies and quantifies the behaviors of visitors um, as they extend onto online platforms uh, by implementing something called uh, content and sentiment analysis. Content and sentiment analysis is a software, or it's the, the rationale, the objective of the software, which detects subjectivity in text, 
Um, so it's a, a massive uh, process of collecting, uh, coding, analyzing Twitter data during this three month long program uh, on the basis of two axes. Uh, inciting visitors to communicate their experiences and make them appear public on the walls uh, of Tate or of the tanks. And I will show you a picture of this. <coughs> so this was out at the wall outside of the tanks with the questions that were uh, posed on Twitter. And so first thing is to stimulate the visitors to uh, report on their experience. And the, the second aim was to um, analyze the reception of the audience by posing these questions and asking th the visitors to, to respond. Uh, and then displaying this information public in front of the venue. Um, so it's, this was, is called now research, audience research and development. It's the main guideline of uh, EU program uh, of subsidy at the moment, uh, which is giving us all trouble because this is what the, the project applications are being judged by. So um, my question is, what does it mean to own an appropriate experience? Um, it means to translate it into image or text, and then to realize the value of this information in communication using social media and social media metrics. Now, the problem is not only that um, the partiality, the bias, uh, or even singularity of the perspective of each visitor was ignored by such a program and cannot be uh, shared um, because the, the extraction of metadata is um, automatic, but it's also um, the, the result, which is the production of algorithmic identities of visitors through these indexing technologies. Um, in the end, uh, the, the, the creators of this program uh, judged that, um, that, um, that the results that are obtained uh, by these tools are dubious and ultimately unreliable. Uh, but at the same time, as I say, that was made public during the program, which serves the uh, imperative of participation and demonstrating performative evidence of the participation of the visitors. So the questions like, does live art need to be experienced live? And then the selection of answers that Tate Modern decides to display. For instance, one uh, audience member tweeted, live experience of art must help audience to spiritually develop him herself. Or the question, what is the role of audience? And then one tweet says, the role of the audience is give the art a sense of life and realism. Or another voice, our role is not to be audience, but part of the performance. Now, um, it doesn't matter so much whether uh, Tate Modern will be a shape, shaped according to these voices, whether the curators will take this into account or whether the, the programs will be evaluated on these terms. But what matters and what is troubling is the, the, this apparatus of surveillance of consumership, which is now part of the museum apparatus. So this is something to say about the rhythm of datification, quantification, and valorization, something also that uh, Sergei underlined in his lecture, the reproduction of valorization and synchronization. Now, the next um, idea that I like to uh, pit idiorhythmy against is social acceleration, which is a major topic in social science and sociology at the moment where modernity is defined as growth, acceleration, and innovation. I'm quoting here one of the discourse leaders, um, uh, the loudest proponent, the German so systems uh, uh, sociologist Hartmut Rosa. So everyday life is accelerated in all aspects, especially in work. Um, work is excessive. Um, leisure disappears because the work is never done. The work is never over. Uh, and the symptoms of, of, of this um, 
uh, process are social desynchronization. So on the one hand, we have economic financial synchronization that I just spoke about. But on the other, on the other hand, in traditional so sociology, this would be um, social desynchronization, a very pessimistic view that, uh, um, that cur in the current capitalism, we have the crisis of ecology, democracy, finance, and so on. Um, what I'm interested in now to look at uh, briefly is how does um, acceleration reshape subjectivity uh, and the performance of the self? Um, how one constitutes oneself or one's relation to oneself, one's truth game in work, and what is the rhythm? What are the rhythms of that process? And now I would like to make a very short uh, footnote on the etymology of the word in other languages than English, because performances and uh, Anglicism that we use in all other languages, but there are other words. Um, one, uh, I mean, it's, always a f it's already a familiar uh, claim that performance defines a new regime of work in post-Fordist capitalism, as when we leave the factory, right? Um, and I think that the German word Leistung um, captures uh, some of the meanings of that. So Leistung designates the motivation to show that someone or something can always achieve more and better. Now, if we switch to French language, the word performance was introduced uh, early on and before 1876, it was reserved for race horses. Now, the French philosopher Bernard Stigler observes that the what the performativity of the racehorse means. The animal is trained to run to its limits. Its body is transformed, uh, sculpted to achieve this result. And then in the beginning of the 20th century, performativity applies to machine via the car. And in 1924, it transfers back to humans, humans in assemblage with a machine a jockey, um, a Formula One driver, video gamer. So performativity stands for setting a record, achieving an exceptional result. Uh, so what we can infirm about performativity is that it denotes transformation as perfection. And there is a quantitative dimension of this process, which we could call training. And this quantitative uh, training is supposed to um, engender a qualitative change a better difference. Now, uh, however we uh, choose to qualify work um, in capitalism today, either as a neoliberal mode of production or cognitive capitalism, post this capitalism, um, what performance refers to, what performativity means, and self-performance is ability. The ability can be um, understood as capacity, competence, talent, skill, as the true value of human capital. Now, Bojana Kunst was already mentioned in the previous lecture in the book that Sergei quotes, writes, I quote, uh, we constantly need to reveal and topicalize our potential abilities. That means that when one performs oneself, um, it's always a promise of potential to achieve ever more, better, different results, to realize the human capital. And there is a self-consciousness also about this self-performance. Um, it could be summarized in, in this formula, which I propose. I am performative to the extent that I can use my abilities and show them to others, that I can sense this myself, that I can feel or be affected by my performance, thus, thus not only rendering visible, but also controlling the effect of my performance. And there are several narratives uh, that I've been researching um, that could flesh out this conception, but I will just choose two of them uh, here. One is familiar to you, that's the narrative of the freelance worker in culture, in art. It can be artist, cultural worker, cultural activist, independent cultural producer, independent curator, writer, scholar. How, do, how could we define uh, this self-performance? It's about regularly extending work into unpaid time, uh, living out the commonplace 
about the fusion of work and leisure as an intense problem. Um, so this subject is defined as the one who invests him herself in activity beyond measure, always in simultaneously several uh, projects and jobs, the multitasking. A significant portion of time is spent on um, self-promotion, on uh, uh, organization, distribution of the work, funding, communication, and so on. And one meaning that is also linked to event economy is nomadicism, nomadic lifestyle, to be in the right place at the right time. But there is a paradox of excess and lack here, a reverse proportion between the amount of work, because all time is subsumed under occupational activities, and the poverty of va wages. Um, it also, there is this image of the dedicated artist or cultural activist who would also do it for no money, as Dieter Lesage wrote, which we could see on the one hand as opportunist, or we can also sympathize with it, that it's also a sign of precarity. But the main attribute, why I'm uh, reminding you of all this, this is what you know very well, but the main attribute of this performance, and this is what I'm interested in, is intensity. Or in a more benevolent account, this person is intensely generous, intensive generosity. When we say this person gives a lot of herself, um, and these efforts, these excessive efforts, are considered a quality of performance. So that's maybe the poor 1%, but I want to now talk about the, the wealthy the, and powerful 1%, and that's the other narrative, the, sec the sector of knowledge work the high end of it, uh, which m involves professions associated with business such as investment banking, hedge funds, um, law consultancy, IT engineering. This is also characterized by intensified pace of work, 120 hours per week, um, electronic availability 24 to 7. Um, no, all of these workers, uh, are highly paid, unlike the artists and cultural workers, the higher their salary, the harder they choose to work. And that's the paradox. And this is where they draw on the freelance style of projects, the lifestyle of the artist, um, cultivating individual entrepreneurship. And this work habit is that becomes comparable to artistic creation. So there is a new management system that has been developed um, where the control of managers has been abolished in favor of self-monitoring performance. So the employees are encouraged to be autonomous like artists so that they can deci decide on the timetable, on the location where they work, if they want to wor bring work home. And the manager explains this new doctrine, I quote, our systems ensure that people control themselves sometimes without knowing it. We just feed back to people how well they're doing, and we leave it at that. We don't even set targets. People compete against themselves. So there is this internalized competition. But um, what is interesting in the multitude of the techniques uh, uh, that I've been um, um, investigating, um, that are part of the self-performance, is that these workers choose extreme experiences to undergo in, in order to maintain high standard of performance. And all these techniques are aimed at isolating individuals from daily rhythms so that the daily rhythms don't uh, hinder this kind of self-imposed race. Um, and one of the techniques that I th find quite hilarious is biohacking. Um, so workers exchange advice about medical nutritional techniques that can enhance their bodily performance because bodies start to fail. Um, and it's like working on a software that you can fundamentally alter. That's the spirit behind it. Uh, but the, the upshot of this performance is again intensity, which isn't always proportional to success and achievement because the studies show that these careers are short-lived and that end in serious physical and psychological damage. 
So uh, average age on the Wall Street is 35, and, and the length of such a career is seven years. So I'd like to make just a few brief comments about what does this rhythm and intensity mean in self-performance? Uh, so this attribute of this, un under which the self-identity is constituted is intensity, and the priority is given to the physical experience of embodiment, um, of an absorbed self and separated from the sense of social dimensions of existence. So it, this intensified self-performance provides physical proof uh, of an intensified feeling of presence, purpose, value in the world. And if we are going to compare it to the truth games that Michel Foucault uh, studied in antiquity, Middle Ages, and partly in the 70s, 80s, uh, before he died, where he observed the Californian cult of the self, uh, which is imbued with this narcissistic vanity, well, now it's different. It's more linked to negative affects. It stems from, and I will make now three remarks about this, um, an obsessive fear of not being worthy and from the hope of an effort toward being valued more. So that's maybe the psychological or social psychology behind it. And the second perspective is that uh, there is an ontological and political uncertainty of the subject which is tied up with the politics of fear and the politics of fear has been just switching its uh, causes from 1980s, from the beginning of neoliberalism. And if we go backwards, we could count uh, the imminence of terrorist threats, preemptive action, financial debt crisis, ecological catastrophe, anxiety in times of reduced welfare. But there's also a fear of desubjectivation um, and indetermination. Um, which is, in my view, um, manifested through the excessive use of apparatuses of social media for communicative self-expression, or even what we could call it selfie expression. And then the third uh, uh, element linked to fear is that um, we could describe this condition as one of a negative assumption of a lack of presence and lack of achievement. So the subject relates him herself um, as by default unaccomplished, underachieved. So in constant search of opportunities to express um, or narrate oneself, enhance and provide proof of one's abilities. Um, the filmmaker Jean-Luc Godard once said, we are given the positive in order to make the negative. But I think we live a reversal. There is now a kind of, um, the departure point is the negative from which existence must be earned, its proofs accumulated and assessed so that one day one might finally be accomplished. Now back to rhythm, and I'm coming to my, I have nine minutes and I'm coming to my conclusive remarks. Um, back to rhythm and idiorhythmy. Uh, so there is a desynchronization and delocalization in a social sense that comes through this internalized competition with oneself. So the metrics continue to tick, but the attempt is to be faster than the clock. Um, and to synchronize means to deliver work and data on time. My question would be, speaking of rhythm and idiorhythmy, not to return to nature or to forming communities uh, that would isolate themselves against the digital speed culture, which is here to stay with us, but um, who, where, how uh, uh, do we have agency to affect rhythms and to generate new rhythms of work, leisure, production, communication, distribution. And I would like to propose or lay a tentative claim that um, if artists are precarious, they're not miserable. So we, are, we have a precarity without misery that we enjoy, which gives us temporal autonomy and allows for experimentation with chrono regimes of life and work against business, against the allure of business and synchronization. 
And I want to make a brief comment on the poetic because I wrote more uh, extensively about it uh, in the text for the catalog, so I don't want to repeat that. But the interesting thing for me that the poetic is, um, the manifestation of the poetic is a falling out of rhythm of production. And I, I could see this, uh, it was quite surprising to see this in Isaias Grignol's uh, work um, that um, the public mobilizes itself in a poetic protest and that this protest can be documented poetically. Or of course in Mladen Stilinovic's conceptualism. Uh, but I'm speaking about the emergence of poetry there where it's not expected, in visual arts, in music, in dance. It's some kind of offbeat manifestation. So it doesn't come on the beat. Yeah. And there are also a lot of, um, let's say, uh, reasons uh, to understand this recourse to poetry. Because we could say poetry is, the lowest, is on the lowest rung of the food chain. Um, and as a mode of production, it is cheap. It requires a minimum of ownership of means, as little as a writing machine. It costs much less than to hire bodies and spaces. Um, and also, but there's something else to uh, uh, discover here also, is that artists seek out poetry to divorce their work from the aesthetic norms and economic contracts linked to these norms. So there is this increase of the uncertain speculative in the way that Laurence mentioned, uh, speaking of Stenger's non-necessary thought, as well as opaque, um, heteronymous expressions. And as um, uh, Laurence uh, told me in a, in a conversation preparing this um, exhibition is that the poetic means that it might not happen. So it's dealing with a mode of potentiality. And this is something that we can also see in the work of uh, Xavier Leroy and Scarlett Hugh, and maybe this we will discuss uh, in the next um, uh, segment. And I would like to give one last reflection. Reading back uh, uh, the text of the curators, uh, the initial text that um, uh, uh, served uh, to, to um, incite uh, the works, and also the text that is now being communicated is in the catalog. I was reminded of a very unpopular author today, a philosopher, and that's Theodor Adorno. And I would like to quote uh, the opening of Aesthetic Theory, the book that was published in 1970, posthumously. Um, and to finish with that, okay, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm pressing the wrong button. You see it. So this is, this, this is the first sentence on the first page of that book. Uh, it is self-evident that nothing concerning art is self-evident anymore. Not its inner life, not its relation to the world, not even its right to exist. There is this uncertainty about uh, the purpose that art serves, uh, Adorno elaborates, and it is uncertain whether art is still possible. And I don't mean it in terms of the neoliberal um, cuts and uh, the disappearance of art as a public good, uh, but I mean it also in this way. And this is a second quote. Artworks detach themselves from the empirical world and bring forth another world, one opposed to the empirical world, as if this other world, too, were an autonomous entity. And I will risk now to be perhaps prescriptive about the politics of art, but it's a question. Eh? Um, I'm currently working on a, on a problem writing together with my colleague Anna Vojanovic on the crisis of social imagination. We could say after many crises that we mentioned here, there is a crisis of social imaginary in society, but also in art. And we pose this question, Anna and I, is art um, the place for reimagining the social? And Anna writes um, that we don't need to expect from these worlds to be big, these worlds that art can create, big, complete, spectacular, intellectually elaborated, as such, that is a small, chaotic, clumsy, experimental, effective. They probably cannot change the society like a social revolution, but they still can hack the virtual of our society and not 
leave it alone to actuality. And, and I try to make an exercise out of this, thinking that uh, maybe we are exiting the post-conceptualist condition um, in which every art of work, work of art must implicitly answer the question what art is. So it must proffer a concept of art. But we could maybe, from the same work of art, try to derive an image of society indirectly. That doesn't mean that this art um, explicitly recommends a certain social ideal, um, but it's more of pushing an exercise of imagination that we spectators, visitors, when we observe art, um, we, we could think and imagine what kind of society um, could be derived um, um, in how this work organizes itself structurally. Uh, how it creates this semi-autonomous world, its modes of perception, action, its actors, its beneficiaries. So this could be a, a mental exercise, kind of test for every artwork. Uh, what would the society be like after this work of art? It's not that we ask the artists to mend our problems, but in a sense of unfaithful replica, could we derive um, an imaginary model, a possible world. And more particularly, because I think our main problem is time today and the chrono regimes, what would the rhythm of living together be like after this exhibition or after this performance and after this work of art? Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.